Hello, and welcome back to State of the Division. This time with UFC 293. Honestly, it's a card. There are some fights I think might be interesting if things go certain ways. But as a whole, I'm kind of considering this the, oh crap, we ran out of New Zealanders and Australians to fight. As you know, this fight is in Australia. I believe it's in Sydney. But what the interesting note was coming into this was that the UFC had, uh, I believe it was 291, they had Adesanya fight, they had Pereira fight, they had Whitaker fight, they had Hooker fight. They had like every notable Australian New Zealand fighter fight on a card, knowing they had an Australian card later in the year. Meaning, coming into this, there was no main event for a time. Or rather, the main event was tied to Avasa versus Volkov. Which... My heavyweight loving heart loved, but I think as a whole, no one really wanted. That being said, there's not a whole lot to preface this card. It's Adesanya Strickland is the main event. Tuabasa Volkov, the co-main. That's kind of a heavyweight rankings match to see if Tuabasa plummets more and Volkov secures his spot where he stands. That being said, I think we kind of got to jump right in. But first, got to kind of look at housekeeping and the butcher's bill. For the Butcher's Bill, I really don't have anything for this fight as of the time of recording. No notable fighters dropped out, no notable fighters got replaced. If someone did, I didn't catch it or it didn't cause too many waves on the card. I think part of that's the fact there's like a WT in like the first four fights. But that being said, for the housekeeping, my record stands at 64 to 51, still over 500. I did go 8 and 5 on the last card, not great. Um, sure, uh, Sean O'Malley upsetting. Sterling was certainly a shot. Good on good on O'Malley. I'm looking forward to seeing him defend the belt. I think a rubber rematch with Sterling is the way to go, just from a booking perspective, because I think you've got enough stories there. Uh, I think Marab has earned a shot, if he wants it. Of course, I think he's injured. I don't think Cheeto's earned a shot yet, but I don't know how many other fighters in that division there are. Uh, also from that card, Zhang Welly proved she was Zhang Welly, and I was way too optimistic with my belief in Lemos. So that being said, I think we dive right in. Starting us off, uh, two WTs. Starting us off, eight and two, Kevin A. Josette takes on fellow WT. Ten and three, Kiefer Crosby. Josette is three years younger, two inches taller, and I didn't see anything on reach, which will be a running theme this card. Josette's a little odd, but he likes to live on the feet with four career KO wins. Now, he doesn't seem to overly rely on the finish with his other four wins being decisions. Uh, he doesn't look to really have much of a ground game, but at the same time, he hasn't lost by submission, only KO and decision. Crosby's a bit more buried with five KO wins, two submission, and three decision. So you see some sort of varied game, though the striking is definitely his most recent trend. I can't speak to his takedown game, but he has been able to submit people, so there's some degree of ability to play out of position or take control of mistakes or other people's takedowns. In the battle of the de debuts, uh, Josette is the narrow favorite in Vegas, and I guess I'll disagree. Quite frankly, it's a little bit hard to judge a fight like this going off sure dog stats without any of the metrics that the UFC measures. Not that those metrics are the be-all end-all, but having metrics to compare fighters is certainly helpful. Uh, I think Josette overall might be the better fighter. But I think Crosby has an explosiveness looking at how he wins and the type of strikes he threw to win. And that gives me a, I say confidence is overstating it, gives me a little bit of an edge to go with him this early in the card. It feels very close. This feels like a 50-50 fight. It feels like it can go either way. But I just think Crosby might have the explosiveness to throw Joseph for a loop. 13-7. and seven, Shane Sugar, it's a bit of a knockoff, Young looks to stop the skid against the 16-6 and six, Gabriel Fly Miranda. Young is three years younger, three inches shorter, but he does take back an inch in reach. Young has been struggling as of late in the UFC, but as a fighter tends to hang on the feet in most of his fights. On that note, he rolls with a 5-2-4 to 5-5-1 in striking, which highlights his biggest issue, or at least in my opinion, the lack of finishing in the UFC. Outside the UFC, he has five career KO wins, but in the UFC, he struggled to f he struggled with getting that power to show up. He's been outstruck fairly heavily in all but one of his UFC losses, and the one where he wasn't was a KO loss. He does have a ground game, but it only seems to have shown up in three of his UFC fights. Miranda is almost the complete opposite, with 15 career wins by submission, which speaks to a ground-focused game where he likes to take the back and control the fight. Of course, as I say that, he does have several guillotine and triangle choke victories, which speaks to the ability to play in different positions. Of course, striking does look like a weakness, since it is one UFC C fight, he was outstruck by 22, knocked down three times, and then was finished. Now the narrow favorite is Young, and I'm willing to guess that's because of UFC experience more so than some inherent skill. And normally, and I think previously, I've defaulted to UFC experience, but in this case I'm going to go with the debut. 
I think Miranda's edge on the ground is going to throw Young for a loop, or it's going to give him the ultimate push here, or just grind him to a victory where he controls and just kind of paces the fight his way. Something that I don't think Young will be able to handle in this case. Ending off our early prelims. 3-2, and two, Mike Mathetta, or Blood Diamond on the UFC page, I don't really know which is true, looks for the rebound against the debuting 7-3, and three, Charlie, Chuck Buffalo Radke, who wins my favorite ring name of the night. Uh, Radke is two years younger, one inch shorter, and I don't know about reach, but I can tell you that Diamond there has a 76 inch reach. Diamond is hard to get a read on, if I'm being honest. I'm gonna call him a strike and focus fighter with one career win by KO, a 326, the 204 is striking so far in the UFC. But on that note, he hasn't had all that much success in the UFC with two fights and two losses. He did take a significant striking lead in his second fight, but his ground game has been perpetually his weakness with a quick submission in, in his first, followed by three takedowns in his second for nine minutes and 30 seconds of ground control. Radke is making his debut and as a whole looks to be fairly varied in his skill set with three KO, two submission, and two decision wins. Bit of a rounder at least in that regard. I don't know the nature of his takedown game, but it looks like he can take advantage of positioning or push the advantage himself. Now, Vegas likes Radke and I'm going to agree. Diamond, despite being in the UFC for longer, I mean two fights longer, has not impressed me all that much. His striking and power exists, we see it exist. But he hasn't been able to show it in the UFC. He hasn't been able to outclass an opponent or put them on the back foot. He's been wrestling the submission. And we're facing a guy who looks to have a ground game. I'm going to pick Radke here simply because I think he can shoot a takedown and hold a takedown. Something that I've seen, seen Blood Diamond struggle with in the numbers and in some of the fights I've looked at for him. Opening up our prelims. The 14-5. Nazrat Hakkras. I'm so sorry. Looks to go two in a row against the newcomer. Seven, one, and one. Landon, Lone Wolf, Quinones. Also very sorry. Stuart. Therefore referred to as Quinones. Nazrat is two years older, takes a single inch in height, but once again, I don't know reach. A running theme on this card. Nazrat is a decently solid fighter, if not a bit streaky with the record. Striking is his wheelhouse with a 506 to 472, and it's that sort of grinding point-based striking, given that he only has one KO win in the UFC. On that side of things, he has proven a great deal of toughness in being able to go the distance despite being absolutely lit up. 188 to 76 unanimous decision loss against Bobby Green, and a 73 to 37 loss against Dan Hooker. Now, he does have a .36 takedown average, but they really seem to be few and far between. But it does exist, and it could be a thing. In the end, he is still a striker wants to stay on the feet with a 78% takedown defense. Quinonez looks to be a striker as well, but he seems to have more of the finish ability with five career KO wins. While I can't speak to the level of his competition, he does seem to be able to either avoid the ground or survive well enough to get back to his game plan. Vegas legs hacks Parast, and I'm going to agree. I think he gets the slight edge having experienced his opponents like Dan Hooker and Bobby Green even though he lost, compared to Quinonez who I really can't get a read on. I know he has power, but is that power is that power for the level he was at, or is that power going to carry him going forward? Obviously, Quinones can win. We have two strikers going at it who seem to like to stay on the feet. This can really probably go either way. It's probably closer than Vegas has it, but I'm going to lean Hack Parast based on the experience, based on the record he has so far, and how he's lost the fights against high-level competition compared to how Quinones has won the fights that we've seen him win. 16-6, and six, Jamie Malarkey looks to get back on track against 18-8, and eight, Jean the Bull McDessey. McDessey is a year younger at 28. Malarkey is either the same height or four inches taller, because Sherdog sure and UFC stats cannot agree, but Malarkey takes a definite six inches of reach. Malarkey has a pretty well-rounded style, but record-wise has been a little streaky. In the stats, he carries a 4-2-0 to 4 2 in striking, but backing it up is some legitimate power and the ability to go to war when needed. Now, he has been caught on the feet, but only twice in the UFC, which is pretty important for how he fights. Now, playing into that is his takedown game with a 2.91 average. Now, he doesn't really seem like a submission threat, but the disruption and control time he's able to get, it's threat enough. McDessey is remarkably similar in terms of style. Numbers-wise, he is technically a little better. 5.52 to 4.04 in striking. However, he doesn't really have that KO touch as of late. I mean, his last KO win was in 2015. So he relies more so on pace and managing his opponent's ability to do damage. Now, he doesn't really have a, really have a takedown game, but does rock an 85% takedown defense, so he has had the ability to hang on the feet. Vegas runs with Malarkey here, and I'm hard-pressed to disagree. McDessey, as of late, has been going to decision with low striking totals and a good number of his fights without takedowns to back those up. Malarkey does tend to have higher totals, but when he has those lower totals, you see him landing takedowns instead, which makes sense. So I'm going to go with Malarkey here, who's been able to kind of 
go for the high total striking wars, but also go for fights where he doesn't have remarkably high t striking, instead getting takedowns and control time in response. I think it's a, I think it's a pretty good battle and McDessie has a chance, but I think Malarkey takes the edge here just based on how he fights and that rounded-ish style of fighting that he has. 12-2, Jack Farr Jenkins. Looks for four in a row against 14, 6, 0, oh, and 1. Jose, backstabs Chepi, Machine Gun Mariscal. Equal age, either equal height or one inch to Jenkins, with one inch to Mariscal in reach. Jenkins looks to be decently rounded, with the ground being a definite strength and highlight of his game. But to start with striking, he carries a 4 3 4 to 2 7 9, which speaks to what he is able to do on the feet and the ground and pound he can possess. I will say that he did struggle in his last fight with an opponent that was able to match him on the ground, which really nullified his ability to take a striking lead and implement that part of his game plan. Now, on the ground, he racks a 3 0 3 takedown average, with 81% takedown defense, meaning he likes to control when they go to the ground and how they go to the ground. He is also good at generating control time with 11 and 6 minutes respectively. He does have 3 submission wins but none in the UFC so I don't know how much of an impact that will have here. Maris Gall is going for a second UFC win in a second UFC fight and as a whole looks to be a little similar to Jenkins. Here's a 4-7-3 to 3 4 in striking with some decent knockout power outside the UFC. 6 career KO wins. But I don't know how well that will carry over. He also does carry a 4 flat takedown average which he used well in his first UFC fight. Favorite is Jenkins with a by narrow margin and I I'm going to agree. Both fighters are remarkably similar and I think they'll be pretty even going into this fight. But in the end, it comes down to me how Jenkins was able to avoid more damage than Mars Skull was. I think that slight striking edge might allow him to pace ahead of this fight or at least make it look like he's taking less damage while teeing off on his opponent. Ending off these prelims, 8-1, Carlos Black Jag Goldberg looks to keep his hot streak going against 15-4 and 1, Da Sese da Wun Jung. Jung is three years younger, either an inch to Olberg or they're dead even, with a single inch in reach heading back Jung's way. Olberg is a finisher, and that sums him up perfectly. He has six career KO wins, and four of his five UFC wins are KOs. He runs with an 8 1 3 to 3 4 5 in striking, with Naka Power obviously waiting in the wings. As a whole, he is a quick starter and gets it done in the first round, but he has shown the ability to go the distance and control his opponents. In that control fight specifically, he had two takedowns, only a minute 15 of ground control, but the ability to use his power to disrupt or gain control time is valuable in the long run. Zhang is also a bit of a finisher, though he goes for both the ground and the feet in that regard. 3-3-9, 3-5-3 in striking, which speaks to the power he's able to pull out at times. However, it also shows the fact he has been caught in firefights and come out the loser. In regards to the takedowns and submissions he runs, he runs with a 2.10 takedown average, and while he has only sunk one in the UFC, he does have two in his career. On that note, he does tend to stack the takedowns when he gets them, but similar to his striking, there are times it can be completely turned against him. Vegas likes Olberg, and I'm going to agree pretty quick. Nothing against Jung here, I just think Olberg's striking power gives him the edge, plus 100% takedown defense so far, and I think physically he is the bigger fighter here, at least muscle-wise. Also given the fact that Zhang tends to walk into firefights, I don't really see that changing here. Olberg's also willing to start them, but he's also proven better at managing the firefights or making sure he ends it quick to come out on top. So in the end, I am going to go Olberg. There's not a whole lot to say here. Both fighters seem willing to engage on the feet, and while Zhang could land a submission, we've got a 100% takedown defense and a fairly large physical fighter that I think can manage that aspect of Zhang's game. Starting off the main card, 9-4, Tyson Pedro. Looks to come back quick against 8-2, and two, Anton, the pleasure man, Turkalj, who wins worst ring name of the night. Turkalj is four years younger, one inch taller, but one inch of reach does go to Pedro. Pedro is a finisher, and by that I mean every UFC win he has comes by finish. On the feet, he racks a 2.96 to 2.49 in striking, with the obvious equalizer being aforementioned power. Though there is some variety, but just not enough in order for me to feel comfortable considering it a major strength of his game. In the same vein, he has been caught on the feet before, given the nature of his striking and tendency to wade into the firefights. When it comes to the ground game, he only carries a .97, but given the fact he's pulled submissions without takedowns, I'm willing to say there is some degree of reversal or opportunism in there as well. Krakalj is struggling with only a contender series win in his three UFC fights. That wise, he racks a 1-5-0 to 218 in striking, which speaks to his struggles to really accomplish much on the feet, aside from keep pace and lose a fight. He does have a 6.97 takedown average, but that does feel slightly inflated with an 11 takedown performance in his contender series win. He did have a 5 takedown performance against Vitor Petrino, but he only got 4 something of ground control off of Petrino's 6 something. Something, meaning that it, he wasn't able to do better than with more takedown. Both fighters are a minus, so my easy out is gone. Pedro is the narrow, narrow favorite, and that's going to be enough for me. This is less of a confidence in Pedro and more or less my lack of confidence in Turkalj. 
I think Pedro's knockout power makes him a definite threat here. Tocolage on the feet isn't great, and on the ground he hasn't proven a whole much, and Pedro has proven the ability to finish on the ground as well. Could Tocolage win this? He's got to put on a hell of a performance and kind of turn his takedown game completely around, and I'm not sure he can in this fight. I think Pedro has the edge when it comes to power, Pedro has the edge when it comes to experience, and I think Pedro has the edge when it comes to finishing on the ground here, because I haven't seen Turkoglu pull that off in the UFC. 11 takedowns is nice, but when you have a guy who's going to constantly submit you and a constant chance to knock out on the feet, you're going to have to go three rounds with him. Now, we got a rematch. 6, 3, and 1. Justin, bad man Tatha, runs it back against 12, 3, 0, and 1. Austin, lame. Tafa is 6 years younger at 29, 6 inches shorter with a 6 inch reach, also going to lane. Now Tafa is a bit of your stereotypical heavyweight, and I mean that with all the love in my heart. All of his wins coming by finish. He rocks a 502 to 595, which isn't that surprising given how I described him, but power, as you can guess, is the equalizer. Tends to finish these fights early, and when they go longer, fighters have been able to eke out a win or take control of a fight and ride it to the end. Does have a 100% take on a fence, which speaks to his desire to keep it on the feet. Lane is similar, at least in his UFC sample size. Outside the UFC, he runs with 10 KO wins, one submission win, but inside the UFC, he only has a contender series win, but in it, he took a dominant striking lead and put it away in the first round. He has gotten caught before, but given he only has three losses, it's fair to say he's proven the ability to avoid getting caught at large. Now, the narrow favorite here is Taffa, but I'm going to take a reach here. I'm going to go with Lane. Now, these guys in the rematch, originally it was an eye poke unable to continue, no contest. But as a whole, it looks like Lane has avoided more punishment than Tafa tends to. Now, that could be a level of competition. That could just be the outlier of the two fights, and this could be a total war. And obviously, Tafa's the favorite for a reason with his experience. I'm just going into this feeling that Lane might be able to manage the height and reach pretty well, at least better than Stefan Struve did, and sort of not outpace, but work Tafa better than other fighters can and maybe avoid Tafa's overwhelming knockout power and kind of lurking range and drag this into later rounds where Tafa has struggled. That's my thought process at least. 18-6, Manel Cape looks to go four in a row against UFC newcomer. 7-0, Felipe, Lipe de Tona dos Santos. Santos is seven years younger at 22, one inch taller. And while I have no idea in terms of reach, I can tell you the Cape has a 68 inch reach. Now, Cape is riding a hot streak and really seems to excel on the feet. He marks a 446 to 392, and in his recent fight has either taken a noticeable lead in strikes or used finishing power to put it away. And with 11 career KO wins, he puts it away fairly often. He also displays some definite athleticism when it comes to his variety of strikes with the flying knee finishes mixed in there. Additionally, he has yet to be knocked out, so his durability hangs in there pretty well. There also is a takedown game, but it's more of the danger comes from his ability to throw submissions out of position, rather. Santos is making his debut, but based on his 2KO, 3 submission, and 2 decision wins, you got a bit of a very bag here in terms of skill set and game plan. I will say as of late he's been more so the grinder with the ground game and submission focused game plan, but still being said, being able to do it all is a fairly nice skill set. Favorite is Cape, and without asking many questions I have to agree. Cape has the experience, Cape has the background, I think overall looking at the thing, Cape's gotten, Cape's been able to grind, Cape's been able to handle himself on the ground. We're seeing him kind of improve as he goes over, and there's just a lot of questions when it comes to Dos Santos in this fight. I think it's a hard debut. If Dos Santos wins it, great on him. But just off the top of my head, off what I looked at, I'm going to pick Cape here. For the co-main event, 15 and 5, Ty. Bam, bam, Tuivasa. Looks for the rebound against 36 and 10, Alexander. Drago Volkov. Tuivasa is four years younger, but he does give up five inches in height and reach. Tuivasa shouldn't need much of an introduction for the sake of this show and my personal pride. Tuivasa is your stereotypical swing and bang heavyweight. He rocks a 410 to 446 in striking with power being the ever present and constant threat. He does make use of his durability to eat shots in order to close distance and start exchanges with his opponents. Obviously, in turn, he can get caught and put away, and against more technical fighters, we have seen him get outworked in that regard. When it comes to takedowns, he runs with a 0-0-0 and a 52% takedown defense, which is perhaps his biggest weakness since some fighters have been able to stack takedowns on him with relative ease. Volkov is a striker as well, but unlike Tuivasa, who is power, 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 he lean turns a more technical striking style. 
Numbers wise, he runs a 489 to 3 flat with a straight up knockout power and that awkward swarming style I have yet to get a name for. On that note, he has occasion he does have the occasional ability to shoot a takedown, but it's few and far between, and I'm talking eight fights ago. He's much better at de defending that takedown with a 73%, though against a very technical and powerful grapplers, we have seen him be taken down. But as a whole, his style is very methodical, it's very measured, and he's found really good ways to put his power to use in this sort of measured striking style that he uses. Pretty obvious favorite is Volkov, and I'm a little torn here. Bias aside, Tuivasa is a Derek Lewis-esque fighter. Someone who always has a chance to win a fight because of his ability to knock people out. Now, bias involved, Tuivasa is one of my favorite fighters in the UFC just because of the knockouts, the celebrations, and the shoeys. So I had to measure here, do I go for the record and pick the better fighter in Volkov, who, functionally going into this, has the better technique, the better style, at least matchup-wise, Tuvasa can get a knockout, but we've seen him struggle with other technical fighters like Gon. And while I don't know if Volkov is quite at Gon's level, he's similar to Gon in how he measures out his striking. He doesn't rush in consistently and put it all on power. Where I go with my gut and go with the guy. In the end, as in right now, I've decided to go with the record. I am going to pick Volkov here. I think Volkov's measured style is going to kind of neutralize Tuivasa's swing and bang. I think he'll avoid a lot of really big damage, and if he keeps himself from getting pinned against the cage, where Tuivasa's done a lot of good work, I think this fight can go his way, and he'll be able to use his reach and kind of athleticism to not so much outwork Tuivasa, but hit him hard enough to avoid any severe damage himself. And for the main event, 24-2, and two, Israel, the last style bender out of Sanya, looks to defend his belt against 27-5, and five. Sean, Tarzan, Strickland. Strickland is two years younger. Adesanya does take two or three in height, because why agree, but a definite four in reach also going his way. Adesanya is an absolute monster at 185. He's a striker who makes excellent use of his mobility and reach to manage his opponents, while also pulling on some sneaky power at times to rock them. In the numbers, he carries a 394 to 288, which really speaks to sort of technical aspect of the style, where he works to reach and tries to keep himself out of danger as much as possible. You don't really see him take huge striking leads all that often, at least in fights that go the distance. He also has a variety of strikes that he can throw, which certainly creates a variety of issues for opponents. In terms of takedowns, he's a .06, which is oddly specific, but not that surprising, but his defense does sit as a 77%, plus his ability to survive on the ground and get back to his feet. Now Strickland's a weird fighter to look at overall, but I'd wager a guess and call him a bit of an all-rounder. He racks a 586 to 428 in striking and has the willingness to wade into a fighter and then pull out a KO finish. The next fight he might then just grind his opponent on the feet and get it to the end. It is worth noting that he's able to rack up large striking totals against a number of opponents. In this last six fights, he's had a over 104 of them. He also does have a one flat takedown average, which does speak to the reliability and strategic uses of that as a disruption recovery tactic. As a whole, I think his biggest strength is his durability and his ability to kind of match styles with a lot of his opponents and take them into positions where he's more comfortable and they're more uncomfortable or match them where they think they have them beat. The favorite is Adesanya, and without any real hesitation, I have to agree. Adesanya is a monster. He's managed the he's managed the style of a lot of different opponents, and he's proven a lot at the top level of the UFC. His striking is great. He's great at managing distance, managing himself, managing his opponent, and preventing them from getting a lot going, and then he can pull on knockout power almost at the drop of a hat, it feels like sometimes. Now, there's times where I can imagine a way for his opponents to win, but I have issues imagining a way for Strickland to win. The only two ways I can think of are dragging Adesanya into his pace and his game, but I don't see that happening given how Adesanya has done very good so far at managing his opponents in that way. The other is landing that sneaky knockout blow, but I'm not sure he can with how Adesanya manages range, reach, and distance. So in the end, I feel almost pressed to pick Adesanya. Of course, I make it sound worse than it is, but I am going to pick Adesanya here. Could Strickland win? It feels like a much farther shot than a lot of other matches he's had recently. So that's UFC 293. Quite honestly, I'm a little higher on it now than I was when I started. I'm kind of interested to see how Tuivasa and Volkov goes. Pedro might be an interesting fight. Uh, Austin Lane, and Justin Taffa. I always like heavyweight bouts. The, I'm, maybe some of the deb, uh, debuting fighters will be interesting. But overall, this isn't a great card in my opinion. I think it's a little weak overall. We're kind of nearing the end of the year, so I think we kind of expect to see a few more of these. That being said, I think going coming out of this card, there'll be some questions answered and questions to ask in terms of ranking. 
But in this card right now, I don't think we're eliminating much or establishing much. If we get a major upset, great. If not, business as usual. But that's all I've got. Uh, go ahead and like, comment, subscribe, do in any order you wish, or do any one of those things. Uh, go ahead and leave your opinion on this fight card as a whole, what fights you're excited for, if you are excited for any, or give an opinion of my analysis, pointing out what I said wrong, what I stumbled over, or whatever you want. This has been State of the Division. Have a good fight.